Start on. All right. Um, I think we will get going. Howard, I hope Carol can tune in. People could come in as they like, so it's not restricted once I get started. So, let me get started. First of all, good afternoon to everybody who knows me and those who don't. My name is Samuel Schaeferts. I am an intern for Forsyth County Extension this summer, and I am giving a project, um, as all interns do, and my project is going to be uh, centered around herbs. Um, so I'm doing a three-part series. I'm doing two videos. This one is going to be on the cultivation of herbs, so what can grow here and how to grow it, and um, all the different varieties. Um, on the 18th, I will be giving my second video it's going to be like this it's going to be powerpoints and pictures and interesting facts about herbs but it's going to be on the history of herbs so different cultures and societies and uh, how it's been used historically as medicine for some and culinary for others and um, you know it's trade you know how it traveled from region to region how some herbs travel from asia to africa to europe to the americas and um so that's going to be the third um, edition of this series on the um, on the 18th, and then I will be also releasing home videos, and that's kind of like the second part. Um, it's not going to be a lunch and learn like this and the historical purposes. It's going to be short clips, and they're going to be on home uses. So how to turn the herbs that can be cultivated here, the ones I'm going to show you in this slide, even into different um, products into different um, home goods such as soaps. Uh, you could turn herbs into salves, uh, which I will explain, and you can make them into tonics and teas, as we all know, infusions. And so my second part of this will be just short little videos that I'll release and they should be available online. All right, without further ado, here is part one, cultivation of herbs in George's landscape. Uh, I've already introduced myself, but I'll do it again. I see some more people. Hello, Lisa. Um, my name is Samuel Schaeferts, and um, I'm going to be presenting on herbs, the cultivation of herbs in George's landscape. So um, I just want to say that um, herbs are, uh, they're a good plant to grow here. That Many of them are hardy. Um, they tend to be from the Mediterranean. Um, I think they're just about a good herb for anybody that, you know, there's a common misconception that herbs can only be grown for their medicinal or not medicinal, I can't use that phrase, I'm sorry, for their um, perception of how they can benefit you. But they can also be grown for ornamental design and they're great in the garden. They have, uh, some of them have good floral um, parts, some of them have beautiful vegetation. Um, and like I said, many of them are hardy. They don't have the pressures that a lot of native um, plants face. Um, because of where they come from, they just don't have that same disease pressure. So uh, you'll see that there's gonna be a lot of plants in there that are very attractive for the garden. Excuse me. All right, so herbs, uh, there's two basic definitions. The botanical definition is any plant that is herbaceous, which means it's succulent. You know? It's green and it's soft and you know bendable shoots and it doesn't grow wood on its stems. Um, that contradicts with some of the plants I'll have on here like rosemary and lavender, which do grow wood and are a little bit more firm. Um, and those fall under the more herbalist definition, I'm doing quotes, herbalist definition, which is that they have some kind of benefit um, to people in cooking and teas or whatnot. And um, those are any, plants um, predominantly grown in the Mediterranean region um, or Europe of more temperate climates, more northern climates. Um, and they can be used for different products. And some of them, like I said, are woody. And then spices, which I don't have on um, our slides today, are another cultural term. They're not really a scientific term. And they denote any, or they're like any plants that are from the tropics. Um, so south, closer to the equator than herbs, um, such as chocolate or cinnamon or whatnot. And so we're going to be focusing on herbs today. So a few things about herbs. 
Um, these are a lot of bullet points, but I'll make it easy for you guys. Um, they do well in mediocre soil, as I've highlighted. Uh, almost a give all for most herbs is that, you know, that they'll, um, they're very hardy plants and they'll do well in our summers, they'll do well in our winters, minus a few exceptions, but they do well in soils that don't need a lot of fertility. In fact, some herbs like basil and uh, some herbs like um, uh, other culinary herbs, they're um, escaping my mind right now, don't want too much fertility or else it affects the flavor. So they actually, you need to moderate the amount of fertility in some soils. Um, they grow in pH levels that are about six to seven. Most soils in the Georgia Piedmont hover around six. So if you do typically have to lime your garden, um, because, um, or not lime, I'm sorry, if you have to bring down the pH because it's too, you need to bring it down for some acidic um, reasons. Uh, herbs actually don't need to usually be had the pH brought down to be grown here. Um, they usually fall in the pH range of most people's soils. And um, so most of them are in the six to seven range. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, there many of them are drought and disease tolerant. Uh, many are deer resistant. Um, the fact that they're not from here, some of them ha are invasive because they just don't face the natural pressures of the ecosystem in Georgia. Um, and but the ones you know that aren't invasive or the ones that are they can be containing containers but the ones that aren't invasive um they grow so well here because you know they don't they're not affected by the pests and the insects that we have and um most herbs are going to be perennials there's a few annuals but many herbs are perennials and um i, I just want to say in the top right hand corner um, I want you guys to notice I have three symbols and I use these symbols throughout the presentation. Um, the bright yellow sun is a symbol for the plant if it is a full sun plant, so it needs six hours a day of sunlight um, exposure. And I actually have it mislabeled, but the one under that is partial um, shade, partial sun. That needs four to six hours of sunlight to be ideal growth. And the one under that is shade, and that these are plants that need to be, you know, uh, planted in some shade. So it gets no more than four hours of sunlight exposure a day. All right. There's about four ways to propagate a uh, herb. Um, first way is seeds. Most annuals are propagated through seed. Um, usually they're done, if you're going to propagate an uh, annual in the um, by seed, you're gonna do it in the springtime, and um, you're gonna do it right around the last frost. Usually March, late March, maybe March 20th is our last frost. Um, I actually am from the Athens region, so it's a little different, but here I believe it's late March. And so you're gonna to wanna to, um, sow your seed if you're planting uh, or usually around that time. Um, so it sprouts after the last frost. And uh, some commercial growers will actually plant their seeds. And you can do this too. Um, if you want a longer life out of it, you could plant it in a container and you could plant it in the winter and then it'll sprout and um, you could transplant it into the garden in the spring. And then cuttings are the other way. Um, tarragon, um, French tarragon specifically is a cultivar, so it doesn't, propagate asexually, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, sexually through seed. It actually is propagated solely through cuttings. And uh, some of the plants we'll see on here are gonna be uh, through cuttings. And then the last two layering is just taking an extending branch and bending it into the soil. Um, that branch will sprout uh, roots wherever the nodes are or the buds. And then you can cut, you'll see in the image on top, I've given you, you can cut um, the branch that's been extended and that'll create two plants. The mother plant would be the plant on the right with, that's already been established with roots. And then the daughter plant would be the plant on the left that would be um, the new plant. And uh, oregano and mint can be um, propagated this way. And in fact, it does so very often. And then the fourth way is plant divisions. 
And that would be only done on plants with a fibrous root, not a tap root. So many tiny little root systems and no major single system of uh, like no uh, large singular root. And uh, many herbs grow too well here, honestly. And there's a recommendation to divide the plant up, which you see in the bottom right. So you would take, say, one plant and cut it up into four plants and then spread them out throughout the garden. And then plants can be grown in containers and they can be grown indoors. Uh, they typically don't do well indoors as they do in outdoors. But um, for some plants like fennel, um, you might want to, they're a tender perennial, which means they'll die in our hardiness zone because we're too cold of a winter. But if you bring them indoors, they can live longer. So a lot of herbs on this list are going to be recommended for containers um, to extend their life cycle. So here are our plants. I have about 30 plants on this list. Um, 38 specifically, this is the first one. And um, this is anise hyssop. And anise is grown for its purple foliage, its spike and fluorescence. Um, they're beautiful. One, one major bonus of the anise hyssop is that it will flower even in poor growing years. Um, it usually tries to flower if, it, if it's under stress. So you'll get this flowering even if it's a bad year where some plants um, experience death or the plant just won't flower on certain years as well. But anise does quite the opposite. And it's a full sun slash far shade plant and it's a native of the United States. And it's a great pollinator. Um, beetles will visit it. Um, I have, um, that is a bumblebee in the bottom left. They'll visit, um, you'll get hummingbirds and butterflies. So it's great for attracting pollinators to your garden. And then we have wormwood. And wormwood or artemisia, it's got these feathery, green gray leaves that are just very soft kind of like lambs here that you can like run your hand through they're great in a sensory garden a sensory garden would be a garden that you plant not just for its visual aspect but also because it's got other things to offer like fragrance or touch um it grows these pretty flowers and it's actually grown in the garden because it's good at repelling moss and fleas and so it's good for warding off those insects that you wouldn't want. And it's a native to the Mediterranean. Um, in the bottom left, you'll be seeing this from time to time. And some plants show the regions that they grow in. So Artemisia, I'm showing you here at top left green is the north region or the region valley. And the yellow is our region that we're in the Piedmont. And the bottom left is the um, coastal plain. So I'm showing you here on this map that it grows in all those three regions. Basil is another full sun plant and it's an annual. And this is culinary basil specifically. There's other varieties like um, holy basil, but I'm focusing here on culinary basil and it can be used in cooking. Um, and it's, it's a worldwide marketed herb. I mean, it's, um, you can go almost anywhere and get basil. It's a coveted um, herb for its taste. And the thing about basil is it needs to be pinched, um, which is basically like pruning. It's just, you wanna take off those flower and fluorescence because what happens is when it flowers, it muddies up the flavor and it makes it taste um, kind of more bitter. Uh, but to keep that sweetness to it, the flowers need to get plucked. Um, and it's an annual and it's planted by seed. And I have down here a rule um, in the green box, 70-50 planting. That means it needs to be planted in later summers when the day's temperatures are up to 70 degrees or higher and the nighttime temperatures are 50 degrees or higher. If it drops below those two, uh, it'll struggle germinating and the plant won't grow so well. Bay laurel. So bay, you've seen it before probably in markets and these little um, dried uh, tubes that you'll see where all the seasonings are. And um, it's a Mediterranean plant as well. And they actually grow very large in the Mediterranean. Um, they grow up to 50 feet. Uh, down here in our region, it's recommended that they get pruned back um, every season. So they're usually kept around 10 to 12 feet, although I have shown in the top corner 
that they can bonsai pretty well. I have a tiny pot of bay that I've shown here and then a larger pot. So they make good for container plants and they're pretty around the house. And, um, and uh, when they're young, they're especially susceptible to frost damage. So it's good to establish a plant maybe in a container and then transplant it later in its life to maybe a larger container, but to keep it indoors over the winter for its first growing season. And this is gonna be a full sun or a part shade plant. Um, for those who are just joining me, hello, and my name is Samuel Schaeferitz, and, um, oops, I'm sorry. And I have the logos I just wanted to show for people who just came. In the bottom left, if you see a bright yellow sun, that's a full sun plant. And if you see what I'm showing here in the bottom left, uh, half black, half orange, it's part shade plant, part sun. And if you see all black, it's a full shade plant. So here we have the black snake root. And this is a native of um, the southeast of the United States. It's an important pollinator for the azure butterfly, which is a gorgeous butterfly I've posted here. And it also grows these great inflorescence and it gets to about eight feet high. The cool thing about the snake root, um, I mean, it's extremely attractive foliage. It goes in purple and green and it can grow uh, two feet in one month during a growing season if it under the ideal conditions. So it just, it grows super fast, kind of like bamboo does. And it grows in the Piedmont and the North Georgia region. It does not grow in the coastal plains though. All right, Borage is, I believe it's an annual here. Yes, Borage is an annual in this region. Uh, it grows well in dry soil, so it does well in raised beds um, and well-drained soils. And the flowers are edible. And I'll have other um, plants on here like chives that also have edible flowers too, so that, that'll be a theme. So the flowers of this Barrage plant are edible. They're also great attractors for the honeybee. And it's a native to the Mediterranean and is planted through its seed. It does not propagate well, um, except through the rot rootstocks, but um, mostly it's um, propagated through its seed. And it's also good at attracting butterflies. Here we have catnip. And uh, if you have a cat that's ever seen catnip before, you've probably seen it elicit this response. It's uh, pretty funny, but um, it definitely is good if you do own a cat to have some catnip around. And um, it's a full sun plant. Uh, it could be propagated in many ways, seeds, stem cuttings, division. It grows very well. It's not hard to grow catnip in this region. And it's a, like I mentioned, it's a vigorous perennial. Uh, it, does this, it does grow slowly and it doesn't get very big. So that's a good thing. It'll grow well, but it won't get too big and it does grow slowly. So it's easy to maintain if you need to. Um, it won't grow rapidly throughout your yard, but it will outcompete a lot of other plants nearby. Chamomile comes in two varieties, that are the two main varieties. Um, German chamomile is on the left, and that has got a more rounded head than the Roman chamomile on the right. German is an annual plant, and it's taller. It's about um, two feet tall and it grows in alkaline soils, so it needs a pH higher than seven. Whereas Roman and most other herbs that I will mention today need a pH of about six to seven. German needs seven or higher. Um, the seeds of chamomile are actually um, recommended that they're grown in seed balls, so the guy pinching the little dirt, um, that's just a seed ball that's been created around, or any kind of coating, um, it just helps with the planting because they're so small. Um, it doesn't do it justice with the little thumbnail image I have because there's no size reference, but they're very tiny, probably less than a millimeter in length and even smaller than that in width. And then the Roman chamomile is the smaller of the two, like I mentioned, and it's a perennial ground cover. And they're used for different things too. The German is used more for teas and then the Roman is used more for potpourri. And I'll show an image of a potpourri later, but it's essentially just a uh, dried floral arrangement that's used for its fragrance. So here are chives and chives like barrage, um, they're edible flowers and they go great in the salad. Um, I can cite my coworker, Sharon, for telling me this. So thank you, Sharon. Um, so chives make a great addition to a salad. They're the smallest members of the onion family. They only grow to about a foot high 
and they can be propagated through seed or division. In the top left-hand corner, I have an image, a drawing of the bulbs, and they're connected at four points, and they can be cut into four different plants, essentially. Um, through that image, it's showing that you know you can separate it into each, into four different parts, and then that'll create four different daughter plants. Cilantro um, or coriander is an annual that grows pretty well here. It does need low drain soils and it doesn't get very large. Um, it's not usually grown for its attractiveness, but it's usually grown for its culinary benefits. But I, I like the look of a cilantro plant. I think they have pretty leaves. And the coriander refers to the seed. Cilantro refers to the plant and the leaves and the vegetative parts. And coriander is used more in Indian cooking. Um, and cilantro is used more in Latin American flavors, um, uh, like tacos or burritos or uh, bowls of um, certain kinds. But it, they're used for different reasons. But the whole plant is edible. In the bottom right-hand corner, I have shown I'm pointing two arrows into two, two different plants. And blue shows a male flower. so Pink shows a female flower. And next to the pink flower, there's one that's crossed. It's got blue and pink parts. That's showing that it's a bisexual flower, which means that this plant grows male and female flower parts on the same flower. So it can actually pollinate with itself. Um, the flower itself can pollinate it itself. And I'm showing this to show that it has bisexual parts, but it also has male parts later on that it establishes. Dill is also a bisexual plant. Um, in the top left hand corner, I've actually shown this, where that you see little tubes or filaments and then um, like mushroom tips on the top. It's very tiny, but you can see it there maybe. That would be the male parts and where it's bumpy and flat, those are the female parts. And those male um, filaments, the mushroom tips on the top, when they start to pollinate, they can actually pollinate those adjacent female parts. Um, and this helps it get established pretty well. It grows uh, well here and it's an annual. And it grows pretty tall, it grows three to five feet. And um, that flower structure is called an umbel. So we're different floral parts connect at one center point. That would be an umbel. And it's a great, um, host for the swallowtail butterfly and larvae, which I've shown the swallowtails, the black um, butterfly when it's a full adult with tan um, dotting patterns on its wings. And then the larvae is got a similar coloration with the black, white, and gold. And um, let's go to the next one. Echinacea is a local. It's a native to the United States and the coastal plains. Um, it's been used, it's been cultivated by Native Americans for hundreds of years um, or a thousand plus years, um, used in teas, um, cooking. Uh, it gets its name Echinacea from Echinos in Greek, which means sea urchin. And as you can see in the top right hand corner, it kind of does resemble a sea urchin. And it does face some pressures down here. Um, Japanese beetles, um, spider mites, and aphids will all affect echinacea. And it's propagated through seed or through divisions. So it can be cut up um, and separated and planted into different plants. And it's a full sun or part shaped plant. Uh, very Cool thing about the flowering aspect is that it goes from summer into winter until frost. It will die, the flowers will die back after frost, but it'll bloom for um, four or five or six months. And there are cultivars that have been grown so that it doesn't need to be deadheaded or the um, heads don't need to be cut off for it to rebloom. It'll just reestablish on its own. All right, fennel is a biennial herb. Biennial means it grows, it has a two-year life cycle. 
and um, the leaves are used for seasoning for fish and the seeds are used for flavoring meats and teas. Um, this plant, just like cilantro and just like dill, um, is a has bisexual flowers and it's self-fertile. I have in the top left-hand corner a picture of dill and a big don't plant this sign in front of it. The reason being is that fill, fennel and dill can cross-pollinate, but they create uh, like kind of like this Frankenstein offspring that's not very attractive and it doesn't do anything in the garden. And so for people who are trying to plant fennel or dill in their yard, it's recommended that they choose one or the other because if they grow both, they will most likely cross-pollinate and create weeds. And um, it doesn't grow very well in our summers, but I have seen it at the farmer's market, so I know that it's capable. But from some publications, I've heard it's, it's difficult to grow here due to the heat. And it's a native of Europe. It's a full sun plant. Georgia savory is um, got multiple color foliage. Some varieties grow uh, purple foliage, others grow green foliage. It's a very busy flowering plant, which I like. As you can see, it grows a lot of flowers when it blooms. And the flowers actually have bilateral symmetry. So I've been sh I've tried to show the difference in this image I have here in the bottom right. Sunflowers and asters and um, dandelions all have radial symmetry, so they're round and they're symmetrical around a single point, which I've shown on the left flower point. And the one to the right of that um, on the image in the bottom right corner shows Georgia savory plants, um, how they are have bilateral symmetry. So around um, like a mirror edge, um, they're the same on the left as they are on the right. Uh, every plant from the Lamiaceae family, also from the mint family, um, has this bilateral symmetry as well. And it's kind of rare for plants, which is why I bring it up. It's a, it's a cool um, floral design. And it's pruned often to encourage flavorful new growth, just like basil. So if you're growing it for its culinary purposes, uh, you should prune off the um, terminal ends of the plant. Hyssop is uh, propagated through seed, and um, it has this spicy scent to it, which is why I have the pepper shown. And it's used in a potpourri for that scent, and it's used well as a perennial plant. Lamb's ear is a soft perennial. It's used as ground cover, and it's used in sensory gardens, as I've mentioned before, um, for its softness and its texture. And it's a native of Iran. Um, Big Ears is a cultivar I've shown in the top right. And it doesn't go to bloom, but it grows bigger um, foliage, hence its name. And it's used as a good ground cover here. Lavender is an extremely attractive plant and also extremely useful. Um, it's got good fragrance, uh, great color. It's native of the Mediterranean. And it can be propagated through its cuttings or seed or division, so many ways. Uh, it actually grows woody um, stems. So it's usually pruned back to keep its herbaceous look too. And when it's harvested, it's harvested in the stage it's in, in that larger picture I have in the center, before the flowers bloom open, because um, that's when the essential oil contents are the highest in the plant. Lemon balm. I want to say I have three lemon plants, and I'll just show you lemon balm, lemongrass, lemon verbena, and they're all part of different families, so I don't want them to get confused, so I just want to show you that real quick. Lemon balm is a bisexual plant. Um, it has a good fragrance, and um, it's propagated through seed or stem cuttings or division, and it grows very well here. So if you want a good fragrant plant to grow here, I would suggest lemon balm. Lemon grass is from the grass family, Poaceae, and its compounds, its essential oil citral, is used in perfumes, and that's what I've shown here. And it's uh, used in also Thai cooking, and I love Thai cooking, so it's one of my favorite ingredients to cook with. And it's a full sun, part shade plant. Lemon verbena, or uh, Loisia trifilia, 
It's part of the Verbenaceae family. It has this cool radial symmetry with its foliage. So looking down, it, it has this cool um, symmetry around its center point. Um, it grows pretty tall, and it's a native of South America. Um, and it's a good perennial to grow. Lovage is a good alternative if you are tired of celery, I guess is the pitch for lavage. It's got a similar taste, but it's different. Um, it's got attractive flowers, so it looks, it looks very good in a garden. It kind of resembles dill. It's got umbels that extend from that singular point. And it's a full sun part shaped plant. It's a tender perennial, and it often fails in our summers. So it can be grown in containers or it can be planted after the summer or in the spring and harvested before summer or after summer in that regard. And they do grow well in fertile soils. Marjoram is a tender perennial and it doesn't get very large. Uh, it can be transplanted. So many times uh, commercial growers will grow it in a greenhouse in maybe the late winter and then plant it in the spring. Um, so it's already been established and it's a full sun plant um, and it's grown for its flavor. It's used for flavoring meats and as a garnish. Mints come in so many families. It's too many families to count and but they, I guess not too many because we have a number here. There's 35 commercially available species and uh, two most popular are spearmint and peppermint. Um, most mints are named for their flavor or their scent. Uh, so orange, chocolate, lemon, and apple are examples. Um, I say they're good container plants. What I should say is please grow them in containers because they're extremely um, productive in the garden and they'll actually spread and outcompete most of your um, plants that you grow. So from left to right, I have different Varieties. Mountain mint is actually a faux mint. It's not a real mint, but it's like a mint. It's got a similar scent and it's got a similar structure to it. And it grows in the North Georgia mountains. And it's a full shaped plant. Um, peppermint um, is, you can tell the difference between peppermint and a spearmint because peppermint has that shiny gloss to it, and spearmint is more papery and uh, light doesn't bounce off it the same. And peppermint grows about twice as tall. And they both grow just as well in the garden. So if you're growing spearmint or peppermint, they're both gonna establish very easily and they'll spread very rapidly. So again, if you're gonna grow mints, um, grow them in containers and then you'll help keep them contained or you can grow them in raised beds if you have that too. Monarda or bee balm is a beautiful flowering plant. It grows along stream banks and bottomlands. Uh, so it needs very saturated soils. It's a native of the United States. It's one of the best pollinators we have. Uh, it'll bring in um, many good friendly creatures to your garden. Uh, it'll actually bring in the largest and the smallest bee. The smallest bee is the Perdita, which I have shown here is that tiny yellow insect um, next to the butterfly. And then the one below the butterfly is the um, is the bumblebee, which is um, our largest uh, bee. And um, it's just a great plant to grow for its attractiveness and its usefulness in the garden. Mullen is a less well-known plant, but it's a great sensory garden plant to grow because like lamb's ear, it has soft, large, fuzzy foliage. And it grows these beautiful, tall, stalks where flowers sprout off and they get really high so like the foliage is low to the ground and then the stalks are exposed well above so it's a really different unique shape than most plants have um, and it's a hybrid of three regions uh, there it's a hybrid of um, species that are native to Europe to the United States and to Asia oregano good flavor, um, it's grown and it can be harvested dry or it could be eaten raw. I, it's recommended um, on, multiple, on multiple publications to dry it, the herb, 
because it, it has a very strong flavor that's kind of numbing too but um i actually like it raw but uh, many people like it dry um it's propagated through seed or cuttings or divisions and it's a full sun plant and it grows very well here uh, it needs dry uh, soils to grow um, parsley comes in two major varieties flat leaf parsley in the bottom right hand corner i've shown here that's also known as italian parsley and then in the top middle is crinkly french parsley and the flat leaf italian parsley has a more strong flavor to it and the crinkly is more mellow. Um, it's propagated through seed, it's an annual. Um, another herb similar to basil, it's an annual culinary herb, uh, it doesn't get very large and it's grown in partial shade. Um, pineapple sage is, I have multiple sage plants on here and this one has, it blooms red foliage. So it's not going to attract bees because bees don't see red, but it will attract birds and it will attract butterflies in large quantities. And it has a cultivar that I really like called Golden Delicious that has chartreuse colored foliage. And it's got its name because it has a pineapple scent to it. And um, the interesting thing about how it's propagated is that it can be propagated in hydroponic or soilless medium. So people can root these cuttings in a bottle of water it's like a very makeshift at home remedy you can do and uh so it propagates very easily just in water and it'll root in there and then it can be transplanted later into the field and it gets pretty tall it gets to be about four feet tall and it makes for a good perennial edging in the garden um i don't have on this slide salvia garnetica which y'all might be more familiar with which is a blue foliage plant um, they're good for different reasons. They're about the same size. They grow similarly. Uh, this won't attract but, um, bees like a salvia garanetica would is the major difference between the two. Rosemary is a very tall herb when it's allowed to grow out, although it can be pruned back excessively and it'll still regrow back very well. So it's a hardy perennial. And um, it's got great foliage, great smell, great scent. It's native to the Mediterranean, and uh, it flowers in the winter. So this and the echinacea will flower in the winter, um, which if you want to switch up your bloom period so you'll ha you always have something blooming, think about rosemary, think about what it can do. It can um, give you some nice color even in later months going into the winter. And it's salt, it's salt tolerant, so it grows well near shorelines too. Um, a very hardy plant. Here we have rue, is a native to Europe. It was given the name God's Grace because back in the day um, it was used for a lot of herbal remedies. Nowadays people tend to stay away from rue um, as far as harvesting it because it has a compound in it that actually gives a skin irritation um, condition known as dermatitis. Um, that If you cook it though, it cooks out. And it has blue foliage, which doesn't convey well with my images I've shown, but it's grown still in gardens, botanical gardens, where it's pretty blue foliage. Um, really, the only place I've seen that it's still used in cooking is in Ethiopian dishes. It's used in a seasoning called Burberry. And, um, but it does, it's a historical herb. It's been cultivated for maybe 2,000 years, so it has some history to it. And it only grows in the Piedmont region in Georgia. Sage is a deer resistant plant. Um, it's in the same family as pineapple um, sage, the salvia family, as well as, I'm sorry, genus, salvia genus, as well as the uh, salvia garnetica. And it is, it does get woody over time. It needs to be pruned back and um, great for great pollinating or great perennial garden there. So used in a similar fashion that a pineapple sage would be used. This is a plant that I've actually never seen in person, although I dream of one day being able to see it. It's a very attractive plant that I came across when I was doing my research on herbs. And it's called Santalina. And it has like Artemisia and lamb's ear and mullein. It has this green 
gray foliage to it. Um, and it can be used as a ground cover and it's an evergreen and a perennial. So it have this beautiful foliage throughout its life cycle. It's used in knot gardens. And a knot garden is, like I've shown in the bottom right, is a, it's more of a formal European style garden. Um, it's kind of, I don't know if it's having its renaissance here. I hope it does because I think it's cool, but it's just intricate patterns that are made. And this can be pruned well, so it can be made into different intricate patterns at home or it can run wild. So I tried to show a lot of images of this because it's got attractive foliage, attractive flowers, and I think it's a great looking plant. And uh, I personally want to learn more about it myself. And so scented ger geranium is a native of Africa and it's planted more for its foliage than its flowers because in its foliage, it has um, the, uh, the scent is where it's stored. And like, mints uh this scented geranium has many different varieties that are named after their flavors um and they're used in many different reasons at home too um for cookies and cakes and teas and also potpourries um some of their scents are coconut rose peppermint nutmeg apple apricot cinnamon uh list goes on and stinging nettle this is a herb that i got to get very intimate with and it is a very painful herb <laughs> so you don't want to get too close to it um it has formic acid that is excreted from its tiny little hairs and so if you put your hand in it it'll feel like you're getting stung by uh, red ants because that's the same acid that red ants carry however the flip side is that it is very high in vitamins and minerals um, and one reason why it's presumed that it has this defense mechanism is because it's many herbivores would want to eat it, many insects would want to eat it. So when it's cooked, it actually cooks this thing, um, the formic acid out, and it dissolves. So it's it's completely fine to ingest once it's harvested. It's actually used in teas, and for the very reason that's so high in mineral content. Um, I love this plant. I think it's attractive. It's just not maybe the best plant if you have young children who will, or pets, or for whatever reason you don't want other people getting in it because it, it will hurt. Um, but I just want to make it known again that cooking it does cook out that formic acid. Tansy is a native of North Georgia and um, it only grows above us, it grows in the North Georgia mountains, so it won't grow in the Piedmont. But I wanted to point it out because of its history and its close proximity to us. If you ever hike the Appalachian Trail, you might become accustomed to this plant. Um, and also it's just got extremely attractive disc flowers that I really like. And um, it has a compound in it called thujone, which causes convulsions in you and shaking. So it's, you know, I think there is a way of harvesting it and I think it used to be used for different reasons, but um, I think cooking it out cooks the food jump, but I'm not sure. So please, I need to do research on that before I can be sure on that. It's a native to our region. Thyme is um, even more, there are more varieties of thyme than there are mints. There's 400 varieties, which is just way too many, but also not enough because it comes in so many different colors. Some are variegated, some are solid. Um, they come in different heights. Uh, they're usually propagated asexually and not through seed because seed tends to produce not viable plants um, or the seed itself is not viable. And they become woody over time. And I've shown here, this is another good ground cover plant like a Santolina or a, um, a lamb's ear, um, but it's got smaller texture to it. So um, it's grown if you want an alternative to grass or lawn, it's a good ground cover or even, um, uh, name is escaping me, but the, the um, red or red clover, white clover. It's another good ground cover like that. Um, and then final plant here we have yarrow, which blooms in so many colors and it dries well. So, it, you know, you could plant it harvest it and use it in a floral arrangement. It's great at attracting butterflies and it's a native to Europe. And it blooms from spring to fall. 
So it's a it's got a long bloom season. Um, we use it in teas. Um, when I was at school, we were taught that it's good for um, infusions. So it's great in your tea, and it's great in the garden as well. And I, this is my final plan, and I think it does a good job of showing, underscoring that herbs are great for home remedies, but I think they're underutilized just for its attractiveness too. And um, I just wanted to show so many pictures to show all the different colors and textures that herbs come in and hopefully expose y'all to some more. And for the rest of my slide, I don't want to go through all this, but I took um, the different, um, I grouped them by what they're part of. So I'll just show you. So I have natives, native herbs, and all these herbs that I have listed are on the slide. They're mentioned on the slide. And I, I've shown you annuals and tender perennials. Um, I've shown you ones that grow tall and small. And so these are just different categories of my herbs. And the propagation, I understand that might be excess information, but unless you decided to grow some of these plants, um, I wanted you to know how you would be able to grow it um, and maybe propagate without just using buying new seed. So I do have tables for propagation um, for every plant listed. So um, asterisk denotes that, for instance, the anise up top can be propagated through seed or division. Um, cuttings, I made sure to tell you if it's a stem or a rootstock. And uh, there's some outliers here. Uh, mints are propagated through the rhizomes and bay is propagated through fresh seed, so it doesn't store well. So this basically, this, this does um, in my uh, presentation. I hope y'all enjoyed and I don't know how long I've been going and how much time I have left, but um, I will stay open for as many questions as y'all have for me and uh, I hope I hope y'all enjoy it. So if there's any questions, please ask. And that is herbs, the death series part one. So thank you. And does anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, Heather, um, what? Mind in the chat box, you said, is this a warm season? Oh. Herb? And I don't know which one. I didn't see that earlier. Which herb do you mind me asking what you talking about? All right, I don't know if Heather, you can hear me or not. Chamomile. Um, yes, the chart will be available to answer the next question. So chamomile, it grows in the summer. Um, when we grow it at Ugarn, it grows in the summer. And I did mention how one is annual, one is perennial. I forget which one. Um, I think it's interesting you've had trouble with it because it grew pretty well at U Garden, which is um, where I've had the experience of growing it. It needs to be mulched, so that might help it. Um, but it is a warm season annual for, I believe, the German chamomile. And then the Roman chamomile should be a perennial here. Um, so that's interesting that you've had trouble with it because it grew pretty well. So I'll have to do some research and get back to you on my chamomile might not establish well. And to Sharon's question, like I said earlier, I will make the PowerPoint available, um, hopefully online, somehow. Um, I'll try to get it online. Oh, so you say it's leggy and um, unattractive. Yeah, so the Roman, it just gets leggy. Um, I'm sorry, the German gets leggy. Uh, the Roman chamomile grows lower. It's about 18 inches high, and the German chamomile is about uh, three feet high, so it doesn't get as leggy. Um, so if you want something that's lower to the ground, uh, I'd recommend Roman chamomile. Uh, 
All right. I want to thank everybody here for coming and joining in. I really appreciate you guys and please tune in. And if there's any questions, you know, you can ask it now, but I'm wrapping up. So please tune in on the 18th to watch a cool, it's going to be like the history channel, but for herbs. So I'm going to have, you know, old ancient texts and old traditions and cultures and um, its uses for different cultures. So please tune in on the 18th at noon to watch my second presentation. And thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And I don't know how to end this, so I might just... <laughs>